This video is going to show you Radio Shack's $500 million mistake. It led to a series of more bad business moves before Radio Shack filed bankruptcy several times and vaporized its store chain. The best in America, Radio Shack. Radio Shack went from the largest seller of electronics in the USA to a small red circle with a single letter R inside that only exists on the internet now. In the early 1990s, Radio Shack decided to sell off its furniture business. The Bombay company was sold to Wall Street investors when the home furnishings brand was in fast growth mode. In the early 1990s, Bombay was rapidly expanding and outpacing its competition in the US and in Canada. Business analysts marveled at how much profit the Bombay company got for each square foot of its retail stores. The Bombay company would continue to outsell Radio Shack stores and earn two to three times more money per square foot by the mid-2000s. That's when the Bombay company would bring in about $500 million in sales per year. Radio Shack gave up half a billion dollars in steady sales every year by selling off Bombay before it had reached its full growth potential. Of course, both brands are still attractive to customers, but they're not owned by the same company that created them. They are both failed retailers that could have supported one another as consumer preferences changed and matured. Think about it. How many cell phones have you owned in your life? And computers, tablets, laptops, small music players, and maybe even a mobile pager. If you think back far enough, your device count will be at least a dozen, but keep counting. And looking back, how many times have your parents or grandparents changed their dining room table sets? Have they ever changed their dining room table since they got married? This is the key difference between Radio Shack's short life cycle products and Bombay's long-lasting furniture pieces. People replace or upgrade their electronic devices and gadgets every year or two with no sentimental attachment. They keep their furniture and then they add more pieces as they do better in life. We've all seen the need for portable electronics as well as the need for versatile living spaces to fill in as multifunction rooms like an office, a classroom, even a dance recital studio. In the decades since Radio Shack and Bombay split apart, it's obvious that the two businesses would have been an ideal pairing and may have supported one another as the economy and everyday life evolved. There's no need to cry about bankrupt companies and fading brand marks, so let's see how Radio Shack got to this half billion dollar blunder by splitting up with the Bombay company. The 80s called. They want their store back. And until 1991, Radio Shack was selling furniture at shopping malls. For those who thought that Radio Shack only sold electronics, you're half right. Radio Shack got into the furniture business when it owned 100% of the Bombay company. And Bombay was a mall-based retail chain selling accent furniture and home decor accessories. We'll look at Radio Shack's business connection a little later on, so keep watching. Let's look at how Bombay was once leading the furniture business and wrote its own history full of shopping. Shocking moments and Bombay operated almost 450 shopping mall locations across North America. There were stores in the US and in Canada. Look at these examples of their traditional style of dark stained wooden furniture. I'll have some more to show you as we explore the company's past. Many furniture pieces were inspired by antiques but they were all brand new and came packed inside ready to assemble flat boxes. Look at where it all started as a mail order company in the mid 1970s. That's when the Bombay company found success by selling affordable small pieces of furniture that weren't fully assembled. This meant that smaller flat boxes could be shipped for a low price. When it went into the mall, it started getting most of its sales from impulse buyers, and shopping mall customers helped grow the Bombay brand as a profitable furniture business. In the 80s and 90s, Bombay was bougie. Along with its furniture collection, Bombay sold some smaller wooden items like velvet-lined jewelry boxes and old-fashioned time clocks. Blue and white porcelain vases were hand-painted in China and then shipped to the stores. A lot of the small novelty items were things like brass telescopes or wooden game sets. Bombay's signature design style was brass and glass mixed with dark mahogany wood and green velvet. Everything was embellished to look expensive and luxurious. You'll still occasionally see their logo on some products sold at discount stores. Rewind to 1975. The Bombay company got its start in New Orleans, where it was started by a guy named Brad Harper. He wanted to sell small pieces of furniture through the mail. Just a few mahogany stained replicas of some antique furniture that would have been common in the 18th and 19th centuries in England. Brad was a genius and figured out that he could sell accent furniture like plant stands, end tables, and butler tray tables without opening a physical store. Keep in mind, this is way, way before the internet. He got stuff custom made and imported it from Asia. He put ads in upscale magazines like The New Yorker to find the right customers for his business. Not much is said about 
about Brad Harper's first business partner who helped him get the company started, so Brad gets most of the credit for the company's early success. By the way, here's a trivia fact. Bombay Company was supposed to remind people of the glory days of the British Empire at its height. However, most people miss the reference. They still bought the furniture anyway. When orders came in, Brad would ship them out in small packages. The customers put their own furniture together. Nothing too crazy. Most often, all the customer had to do was screw the legs on a table. Before it was owned by Radio Shack and at the end of the 1970s, the Bombay Company was racking up annual sales of about one and a half million dollars, and it had a few dozen pieces of accent furniture advertised in different magazines, but even with a million and a half dollars of sales coming in, the company was losing money. There were some early problems. The quality of the products varied a lot, and some of Bombay's overseas vendors in Asia turned out to be flaky or even sketchy. At the start of the 80s, the Bombay company's growth hit a brick wall, and it really had limited growth potential because it was only a mail-order catalog business. So, Brad meets this business guy from Canada named Bob. Officially, his name is Robert E. M. Norse, who was a Canadian entrepreneur. He's a key figure in the company's past. Brad and Bob hit it off, and in 1979, Brad signed an agreement with Bob to let him start selling Bombay Company products in Canada. This was a pretty sweet deal for Bob because he got the entire Canadian market for one dollar and he only had to pay a 4% royalty on Canadian sales. Bob knew that Canadian mail order sales were low, so he turned the Bombay Company into a superstar mall store. In April of 1980, the first Bombay Company store location opened in Toronto at the Eaton Center Mall. This happened to be the most popular mall back then. Bob had figured out that the Bombay Company needed three things for the first Bombay concept to work. Value, fashion, and instant availability. As long as the products were made in Taiwan and other East Asian countries, he could rely on getting low-cost inventory, and royalties could be paid after the item sold so he didn't have to pay 4% up front. Bob goes all out to make his store the most fashionable in the mall. He wanted to hook his customers from the mall by luring them in to this uniquely designed Bombay Company store layout that was unlike any other store and his first store design was a little over the top. He got a designer to build a 2,000 square foot replica of England's Fountain Court from Henry VIII's palace at Hampton Court. Here's what the original courtyard looks like. Yes, he built something like this inside a shopping mall. It cost him a quarter million dollars back in the day. He used half of his own money and got a bank loan for the other half. I've only read about the first store design, so let me know if there are any photos on the internet down in the comments. To pay the rent each month for the mall space, the Bombay company needed impulse buyers right away. They could sell a lot of stuff fast since furniture came flat packed and they could keep a big stack of boxes in the back of the store. The benefit for customers was that they could take home their furniture items as soon as they paid. So Bob became the king of FOMO at Canada's hottest shopping mall. The Bombay company was selling immediate gratification to furniture buyers. At an old school furniture store, customers would pay for their stuff and then wait 6 to 12 weeks before they could get it delivered. Whereas Bombay had almost three dozen pieces of furniture available to be carried out of the store as soon as the customer paid. These furniture boxes literally fit into the trunk of a car. So, no surprise, the three elements of Bob's successful retail business were working to make the Bombay Company store in the Eaton Center Mall an immediate success. Here's a good point to mention that Bob's elaborate store design wasn't the first Bombay Company store location ever opened. Before Brad met Bob, there were two locations in New Orleans. One was mostly a showroom for interior designers and neither location was located inside an indoor shopping mall. Both were a totally different concept than Bob's Canadian store design. Back in the U.S., things weren't going so well for Bombay. Three months after Bob opened his first Bombay store, in July of 1980, Brad dumped 80% of the company's stock to a Texas holding company called Tandy Brands, Inc. Spoiler alert and future video idea, Tandy Brands was really Radio Shack. Brad got $26,000 out of the deal and they paid off the company's loans. Five months later, in July of 1981, Tandy Corporation decided to buy the other 20% of the Bombay Company that they didn't already own. After a full year of successful business in the Eaton Center Mall, Bob needed more money to buy more inventory and build some more Bombay Company stores. Technically, the banks weren't lending money for this in the early 80s, and Bob already had taken out a $125,000 loan to build the first store. So Bob sells out to Tandy. In August of 1981, Tandy got all of the Canadian business. Bob had some mixed feelings about Tandy. He made the news when he told an Inc. magazine reporter, if capital had been available at a reasonable cost, I never would have sold. 
but at the time, it was the only way to grow the company. Bob was still in charge. He got to run the Canadian stores for the Bombay Company. And with a big influx of money from Tandy, he was able to build 13 stores by 1983. They all turned a profit. The situation in the U.S. was kind of the opposite. Tandy copied Bob and opened three dozen Bombay Company stores, but they kept losing money. Bombay sold computer cabinets and TV stands that looked a lot better than cheap laminates. And I'm not even going to comment on how tacky the plastic looks from Radio Shack compared to Bombay's dark mahogany shelves and cherry wood boxes made to fit videotapes and CDs. Remember people, this was being run by Radio Shack. So the business was hemorrhaging cash and racked up $3 million in losses in the first three years. By the end of 1983, the U.S. business situation had become desperate. Tandy's CEO decided to hit up Bob and get him to take over the U.S. Bombay Company locations while he stayed in charge of the Canadian stores. This is when Bob became the king of Bombay. Bob got to work at the start of 1984. His strategy to fix the business was to close the unprofitable U.S. store locations. They mainly had bad spots in the mall without a lot of foot traffic. Nine of the company's 36 American stores got cut and were shut down. Bob told a reporter that the Bombay company stores needed spots with high foot traffic. He told an industry trade journal, we saw our concept as selling home decor in malls and other high traffic locations and that a number of the stores were in bad locations. That first year, we closed more stores than we opened. Let's get into a bit of nepotism. Bob gets his wife to design some new products. Her name is Alexandra Norse, but I think she goes by Alex now. You can see how her name is spelled on the screen. She used to be an advertising executive before she took charge of the Bombay company's designs. It was probably a pretty small department. She decided that the company should shift away from masculine military style furniture, manly stuff that looked like it was being built for the next British war. She wanted things to look more feminine and traditional. Her three favorite favorite styles were Chippendale, Hepplewhite, and Queen Anne. It was kind of fitting because she became the queen and Bob already was the king of Bombay. She also brought in some new decorative home accessories plus mirrors and lamps. She even had printed fabrics made for interior decorating. She was hustling. There was a constant flow of new products sent to their store locations. The Bombay company started mailing seven different catalogs a year to show off their new stuff. In 1984, the Bombay company started opening more stores again. They hit up Tandy, aka Radio Shack, for a loan. They managed to stop sliding downhill in 1984, even though they lost another $3 million that year. Things turned around pretty fast. Halfway through 1985, the Bombay Company was back in the black, making a profit of half a million. With some extra cash in the bank, the Bombay Company began to step up its plans to open up more new stores. It picked parts of the United States where traditional furniture was still popular in people's homes. They decided on the mid-Atlantic states, Midwest, Southeast, and the Pacific Northwest. This is when Bombay Company stores started growing like gremlins. In 1986, the company had 75 different locations and brought in a $2 million profit, and more stores kept popping up. So in 1987, the number of Bombay Company stores was 114. In the late 80s, between 1988 and 1989, the Bombay Company went into the Sun Belt. They set up stores in Los Angeles and South Florida. These stores were a little different because the outside architecture had to blend in with other nearby buildings. Here's what Alex said to a magazine reporter. We have to be careful. This was in 1989. We always wondered about the Sun Belt, but our Southern California stores and our store in Palm Beach are going gangbusters. By April of that year, the Bombay Company had opened a total of 190 mall store locations and they were bringing in $79 million a year, which was on top of the $55 million from 1988. Now, Bombay was ready to take on some 90s design trends. The company experimented by selling new products with neoclassical styling, which they thought would complement its other Georgian and Victorian products. They didn't stop with new product designs. In September of 1989, the Bombay company went big for the Big Apple. They put their flagship East Coast store on Madison Avenue in Manhattan. That one began turning in record sales. While the Bombay company kept growing and growing, its corporate parent, Tandy, was trying to get rid of some other brands that the corporation owned. All of them were smaller and less profitable than the Bombay Company. 
This went on all throughout the 1980s. In 1984, Tandy closed two chains of its retail stores, Western World and Ryan's. By the end of the 80s, Tandy Corporation was in love with the Bombay Company. And on November 9th, 1990, the company changed its official name from Tandy Brands to the Bombay Company Inc. Tandy decided to sell Bombay while the company looked good to investors. So in 1991, the Bombay company kind of went through a divorce from Radio Shack. It was a friendly divorce since both sides were getting lots of money out of the deal. To kick off the 90s, the Bombay company tested out three new concept stores in Southern California. They were named Alex and Ivy and they sold the same type of merchandise that the Bombay company stores were selling. Their products just had a different design aesthetic. It was more of a casual country theme. There aren't a lot of photos online of their stores and products, so just imagine what an Eddie Bauer home store might have looked like back then. It got a little confusing for customers because some of the Bombay stores were right next door to Alex and Ivy, and they both tried to sell a lot of the same stuff. We're gonna skip over Alex and Ivy since it deserves its own video. Let me know in the comments if you want me to make one. There was a recession in the early 1990s, which slowed the Bombay company's growth a little, but it was still growing. And they were at $112 million mid-1990, and the profit was a little over 12 million bucks. New stores kept popping up like gremlins because they opened 43 more stores between 90 and 91. They hit $140 million in sales, but profits stopped growing at this point. Okay, here's why a Nepo spouse isn't always the best pick for a job. In 1992, the Bombay Company's mall stores were cramped full of merchandise. These locations were the size of a small boutique store when they were built. A lot of new products just didn't sell fast enough and more kept coming in each week and piling up. To fix this mess, the company went to New York City and built their first superstore in Lower Manhattan. They kept running their Madison Avenue location and tried out this second New York City location as an experiment. The new store had about 3,500 square feet of space, which was double their usual 1,700 square foot stores. When the concept stores started selling a lot of stuff, the Bombay Company expanded two more locations to a much bigger space. In February of 1993, the Bombay Company decided to turn almost all of its locations into superstores. It made sense at the time. Double the size, double the sales. Here's what Bob had to say. I believe a business, and certainly a retail business that changes so quickly, has to keep reinventing itself or it will wither and die. That was his way of telling Inc. Magazine why Bombay was abandoning their original smaller stores. By the end of 1993, the Bombay Company had opened 100 superstores, so the size of their locations was doubling. They moved fast and decided to add 50 more superstores every year. In November of that year, the company opened its 400th store. 26 of those were Alex and Ivy locations in some different states. Added together, both chains had 232 million in annual sales with a profit of 16 million dollars. The business world noticed Bombay's success and Robert Ian e. Norse was named Entrepreneur of the Year by Inc. Magazine in 1993. He won another business award the next year as Ivy Business Leader of the Year for 1994 from Ivy Business School which is located in Canada. Christmas in 1994 was pretty sweet for Bombay. They used their holiday cash to experiment with different Alex and Ivy store designs, even though it was only 5% of their business. In January of 1994, the company upgraded its computers to speed up sales and keep better track of their store inventory levels. They started building a fourth warehouse in Atlanta to hold some of the extra inventory needed for their superstores. They already had three other warehouses in Texas, Pennsylvania, and Canada. Around this time, the Bombay Company decided to join a new TV shopping network called Catalog One. That was created by Time Warner Entertainment and the catalog company Spiegel. Catalog One was on the air for about a year. It didn't do much for the company, but Bombay didn't need it to grow. Nothing could slow down or stop Bombay's success or stop it from growing. Even with bad weather across the U.S. at the start of 1994, the Bombay Company continued to post strong financial numbers and to open new stores at a quick pace. The Bombay Company was well positioned in the mid-90s to continue its dramatic growth into the next millennium. This is where the story ends for now. Things are going to get juicy in the mid-90s and the company had some pretty outrageous maneuvers. They tried a few tricks that were going to backfire. Betrayal seeped into the company and reached the executive floor. Finger pointing over big mistakes will leave you shocked. You won't believe who was to blame for the company's biggest problem that led to a downward spiral. 
And no, it wasn't Radio Shack. Prepare for an extreme roller coaster ride that's just about to start. You'll want to see all of the boardroom drama unfolding while the Bombay company goes into bankruptcy and attempts to rebuild itself in the years ahead. 